Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Gonzalez. I'm the vegetable crop specialist for Manitoba Agriculture. And I'd like to welcome you to the first of five webinars that'll make up this year's 2021 Horticulture School March webinar series. The topic today is sweet corn production part one. Not exactly sure how far along we're going to get in this, but uh, today, but between today and next Wednesday, we will uh, go through uh, sweet corn production. Just as a, a bit of housekeeping, if you have any questions during the webinar, enter them into the questions tab and we will get to them by the end of the presentation. Not sure exactly when we'll get to them, but we will get to them, I promise you. Um, over the past uh, few years, we have uh, presented extension information in person at the annual horticulture school and throughout the winter at uh, off-season meetings. COVID-19, however, has caused restrictions, as we all know, on everything, including our extensions. So Manitoba Agriculture and our partners, AFC and ACC, have chosen to uh, use the webinar format. We ran a series this past summer and it was quite well received in the sense of number of attendees and number of views to the videos, recorded videos once they were posted. Uh, today, or, or sorry, the, the webinar series that begins today will continue with Sweet Corn Production Part 2 next Wednesday. And then on March 17th, the uh, presentation on Passive Solar Greenhouse. Then March 24th, hydroponic vegetable production. And March 31st, there will be a pumpkin and squash production webinar. Basically, if uh, you know of anyone else who may be interested in uh, attending the webinars, feel free to forward them the information or send me their email and I will, uh, I will send them the information. Our speakers today, including myself, we have John Hurd, uh, Manitoba Agriculture Crop Nutrition Specialist, John Gavlosky, Manitoba Agriculture Entomologist, Vikram Bisht, Manitoba Agriculture or Horticulture Pathologist, and Kim Brown, Manitoba Agriculture Weed Specialist. Uh, basically, I think we're ready to go, so let's get started. Okay, so thanks, Tom. And we've decided to do this as a question answer approach. Uh, I'm John Herb and I'm also a sweet corn grower. I supplement my meager government uh, uh, paycheck uh, by growing a couple acres of sweet corn to put my kids through college. So I'm going to start asking questions, put Tom on the spot. And uh, so the first thing, uh, first question we have Tom is, uh, how do I decide, decide which sweet corn varieties am I going to grow? I mean, they're, they're, it looks confusing to me. Well, I, I think the first thing that we're going to have to to look at is uh, the sugar types, and I don't want to be accused of being too technical, but I got it for a minute here. Be a little technical. So there are some different sugar types out there. There's standard, super sweet, sugar enhanced, and the combo of uh, both uh, standard and uh, super sweet together. And they're gonna differ in a lot of the qualities, uh, including sweetness and things, uh, stuff like that. So the, uh, the newest ones are gonna be the synergistic uh, varieties. Some people call them sweet breeds. And that's a combination of, uh, that's a combination of standard super sweet and sugar enhanced uh, genetics. Um, these new varieties have uh, higher sugar levels and their ker kernels are more tender. So there is some advantage to it. The thing we have to be careful of in our world here is days to maturity though. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So these new varieties, the uh, synergistic varieties need to be planted, the majority of them need to be planted later as they they germinate poorly in cold soils and if you look at the kernels on uh, those varieties about 25 percent of them are from uh, sugar enhanced about 25 percent 
from SH2 and about 50% from standard uh, genetics. Uh, other varieties, you, you can, that, that percentage varies is what I'm saying. There's no set guarantee. For example, you're not always going to get 50% coming from standard uh, standard varieties. Could be 75% kind of thing. So there, there is some variability there. Um, the standard sweet corn varieties are known for basically uh, traditional flavor and texture. I would, they, they retain their quality for a couple of days. They're not exceptionally great storing uh, varieties and the sugar is quickly uh, converted to starch. The, the shrunken two sweet corn, like SH2, it, it contains more, about twice as much of sugar as standard varieties. And that conversion is happens at a slower rate. So those two things combined make for those types of varieties, the shrunken two varieties, to be significantly sweeter for a longer time. Uh, so basically you can harvest them and store them for a longer period. Um, but they're not perfect, I mean. So yields of uh, the shrunken uh, two varieties are generally lower than standard sweet corn. The SH2 is also uh, smaller, generally here, I'm, I'm talking generalities, than uh, sweet corn varieties, and germination can be slower, sometimes even poor in cold soils. Uh, while standard sweet corn can be planted earlier, the shrunken head two varieties, you gotta wait to plant. So in our world where uh, we're fighting uh, to get stuff in as early as we can and get it off before it's uh, too late, you gotta be careful, I guess, with growing SH2 varieties. Um, Sugar levels of the uh, sugar enhanced corn are kind of between the standard uh, sweet corn and the shrunken head two varieties. Uh, the sugar enhanced corn is more tender and easy to chew, uh, which definitely is a uh, selling feature for- uh, Especially for people of our <laughs> age tone. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was uh, just thinking that uh, I have a dental appointment in a month. Yes. So we'll see how that goes. Um, excuse me, <clears throat> harvest and storage periods for the sugar enhanced varieties are a little bit longer than for standard varieties. Uh, generally, we re would recommend that sugar enhanced varieties be planted a little bit later than the standard varieties. Now, when we're gonna be selecting varieties, especially in our world, we've kind of talked about the genetics there. So that's where we, you got to make some choices because you couldn't plant all shrunken head to uh, two varieties because you, you wouldn't get enough early uh, maturity and you might, depending on the season, you might not get much uh, at the very end. So we got to be looking at selecting varieties with days to maturity that are going to match up with what the reality of our situation is. You look online and find uh, some great looking sweet corn that takes, I don't know, uh, 140 days or something to mature. Well, lots of luck, I guess, is what I'm saying. So basically, I'm not going to list all the varieties that have ever been grown in Manitoba, but just sort of more common ones that are around peaches and cream. We all know it by name. And matter of fact, it's kind of like skidoo. A lot of people call any bicolor peaches and cream. They don't just, <laughs> it doesn't have to be the variety. But anyway, it's around 80 plus days, depending on uh, where you where you are. Uh, Bodacious, uh, it's a sugar enhanced uh, variety. It's just yellow. And I shouldn't say just yellow. It is yellow. And uh, it's about 75 day maturity. Uh, more than a few people will use that uh, for an early uh, one. Anthem's a little newer, uh, it's a shrunken head too, it's a bicolor. Sometimes, depending on the location, you can get away with 75 days, but it might be a, a few days longer in reality. Uh, Northern Extra Sweet is SH2, it's yellow. And again, I've seen it as low as 70 days, but 
in some fields where it doesn't warm up all that quickly, it can be longer. So, so Tom, when I'm at the farmer's market, everyone's always asking me, is this GMO corn? <laughs> and so, so tell me, do, do we have GMO corn for yeah. uh, Manitoba? Well, de definitely there is, uh, there is for sale GMO, uh, GMO corn out there by various suppliers. Um, I, I think the one thing we have to talk about though, once we're getting into to this, is is anyone gonna buy it? Will consumers accept it? Be, because let's face it, it the, the two traits that are in sweet corn right now, some individually, and I think there's a few varieties that are even stacked together, are BT and uh, the Roundup Ready gene. Now, that's going to make growing a, a, as a manager. If, if you're like John, supplementing his uh, salary by growing corn, if it's going to be easier. You won't have to be worrying about uh, as much about worm control, weed control. You just plant, and we still have to scout, but you're not going to hopefully run into the problems. But saleability is the issue. Are your customers? going to accept GMO corn. There's a lot of hysteria out there. It's not my uh, my doing or anything, but as your uh, your facilitator here, what I'm saying is you got to be safe. And when it comes to being safe, I would not be growing it at this point personally, just because I don't want to get stuck with it. But that comes down to your uh, your market. Yeah, but I get asked at the farmer's market, uh, I, I say, no, I don't grow it. In, instead, I have to spray three times for weeds <laughs> and four times for bugs. So there, there, there's your trade-off. Yes, well, like, like I said, it's not uh, my personal opinion that GMO should uh, not be uh, not be grown. But uh, again, it, it's, uh, it has a, uh, uh, what can we call it, a black eye in the, in the consumer's uh, sense so the consumer is the ultimate uh yeah they they judge because they're buying they they open their wallet um okay so continuing on with how what how do i decide what varieties to grow so we've got to look at some other traits the the height of corn is certainly uh variable uh what what you can buy out there now the ability to, if, if you are spraying and you're using a ground rig versus, uh, depending on the size of your plot, having an airplane come in, you, the shorter your uh, the shorter your corn stalks are, the uh, easier it's going to be to to drive over them with a ground rig, be it a tractor or whatever. Now, some people are not using. Uh, uh, tractor for spraying, they're a backpack or, or whatever. So again, there's just something to consider based on your operation. Now I put this in kind of facetiously, but how tall are pickers? I mean, most cobs aren't too high on the- Sometimes on... they're too short for me, Tom. I gotta <laughs> bend over too much. Well, John's point is well taken. I mean, I have uh, not picked corn for a living, but I've picked my share of corn and most of the time my back's sore from bending over as opposed to to reaching up, but uh, basically, just wanted to throw in there that you should uh, should account for uh, basically whatever situation you can think of that's going to be better in your on your farm in height. Sometimes a little taller is good. Sometimes in stock, sometimes a little shorter is better. So you decide. And if you find a variety that's working well for you, I wouldn't be looking to change based on just height. Um, when it comes to mechanical harvesting, the, the height of the crop really shouldn't be an issue with modern mechanical equipment. Some of the older mechanized harvesters tended to plug up a fair bit, but uh, the, the newer ones, well, they're, they're pretty good at chopping through, the, chopping through the corn. So mechanical harvest is not a problem when it comes to height. Um, Another trait to consider is cob size. Generally speaking here, the larger the cob, the greater the saleability. 
Um, like anything else, the start of the season, you can get away with a little bit, you know, if you have slightly smaller cobs, but you're the first one in the marketplace after a, a long COVID winter of uh, having no fresh uh, corn, you're, you're going to be able to sell. But as the season goes on and you get into, you know, away from the first week or two, cob size becomes significantly more important. Um, hip fill is uh, something to uh, to consider there. Again, from uh, the aesthetics that consumers are looking for is uh, when they open the corn, they don't want to have uh, a whole bunch of uh, of empty kernels there at the at the top and a pointy cob that looks as if uh, somebody had eaten the top uh, quarter of it off or whatever. So uh, again, that's a characteristic. To, to be looking for. Most, uh, most newer varieties, this is, uh, and it's pretty well documented that breeding uh, has taken, made this problem much less than it was uh, years and years ago. Um, sorry here, depending on, uh, I, oh, I missed one thing here, sorry, there I go. So where to buy seed, is uh is kind of the, the the next thing it's not so much a trait but i wanted to put it in here just because depending on the acreage you're planting if you deal with a commercial uh supplier you're going to get a, a better price than a retail outlet, generally speaking um but more than that you're going to have access to what i would call uh, newer genetics uh genetics are going to not, I don't know if make or break is too strong a word probably or a phrase for it, but genetics are going to give you advantages in the way of profitability. So I, I would be saying look for a commercial supplier. Don't, uh, don't go retail. Um, now, if you're a very large, large acreage, obviously you're going to get some kind of volume discounts, but I, I wouldn't be so focused in on uh, trying to get a volume discount that I buy twice as much seed and say, well, I'll stick it in the freezer for next year and that. We're gonna sort of go over later on a little bit about uh, carrying seed over, but uh, just to get a discount, I wouldn't overbuy. For I'd buy my needs for one year. Um, I don't wanna be seen to be recommending any one supplier more than another, but I would say 70 to 80% of the producers that I've talked to over the last, whatever, four or five years, and these are, are not the huge 200 acre sweet corn growers. These are sort of 25 or 30 at a max down to an acre or two at the bottom. They, they deal with Stokes, because and Stokes has a multitude of sources, different seed companies, that they have stock of uh, varieties. So it's not like you're dealing with one seed company. So again, I'm not trying to push you there, but as an example, that's a good source for uh, what I would call the small to medium size sweet corn grower. Oh, uh, next question is, what, why, did, why did my corn taste like crap when I seeded it <laughs> and the neighbor seeded his field corn close to me? Well, that comes to isolation, John. That's a great question, and I, I, I know from uh, from experience that uh, field corn too close to sweet corn can take some of that sugar out of the uh, out of the kernels. So isolation is what you need, and do you need it? The answer is generally yes. Now, again, don't want to be too much science, but about half the genes expressed in uh, in corn come from uh, the plant that makes a year and the other half come from uh, the pollen. So that, that's where the crossing comes from. So the expression of uh, genes from the pollen makes it necessary to have isolation and it's about half the genes. So you're, you're gonna potentially wind up with having a little bit chewy and not so sweet corn if you're too close. Now, basically that's just what I said there. You're gonna get expression of uh, 
the genes uh, from the field corn versus the sweet corn. Um, all types of corn should be isolated from field corn by at least 100 plus yards. That kind of 300 foot minimum, you know, up to 400 feet. That that should be your target. Now you can think of isolate. That's physical isolation, but you could also isolate it from uh, from the pollen in the sense that you could target sort of a 14 day difference in the tasseling dates. So there is no cross pollination. So depending on when you plant, it's going to make as can make as much of a difference as how far you plant away. Like if your cobs aren't fertilizing when grain corn is tasseling, it doesn't matter. It's not, the pollen isn't magically going to seep through the husk and cause the problem. It's got to get into the ear and pollinate to cause the issue. So isolation in distance, but isolation also in the sense of timing can be another way to control it. Um, I often get asked about uh, the effect of uh, pollen distribution on by the wind and the prevailing wind direction. So if the wind's mostly out of the northwest, say, and uh, to the northwest of me where I have my corn is uh, some field corn, obviously there's going to be a higher potential for transfer of pollen than if the grain corn is southeast of me. But th those are the rows, Tom, that I, I, I give to my in-laws to eat. <laughs> I thought you sold me some of those one okay. time, John. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I, I just don't know how to quantify that though. Um, it, it will definitely affect it, but to, to what degree, I, I just honestly can't say, but. No one can. No, we don't know where the wind's gonna blow, but we know that the yeah. rules are there. So, so generally speaking, the answer is to that part of the question is, yeah, the wind affects it, but how much, not sure. Now, conversely, let's say where we're say we have a, a fairly isolated uh, area where we're targeting an early uh, planting of corn the sun's beating in there early on the snow's melted it's nice and warm and trees all around it but uh where there's green corn on the far side say the the north side or the west side of uh, the shelter belt that surrounds where we're going to plant corn well, once that shelter belt is uh, leafed out, which would be by the time tasseling's going on, there that's going to slow up the, the movement, decrease the movement of pollen into there. But again, just like with the wind direction, I can't tell you by how much, and like no one really can, but it is going to affect how far that pollen can travel. It's going to reduce it. So depending on where your, what is around your sweet corn is also going to affect it, I guess. We gotta be cognizant of that. Um, again, a little bit of uh, detail, I guess, here. The shrunken head varieties, you gotta have them isolated from standard or uh, sugar enhanced ones at pollination. Um, it's not essential however, to isolate sugar enhanced from standard. Uh, isolation will allow for full expression of the uh, sugar enhanced and the uh, synergistic uh, corn traits. So if you're paying for genetics and you're not isolating properly, you're in effect diluting the genetics you paid for. So I, I guess consider it that way. If you're picking varieties, newer ones for sweetness or for cob size or some characteristic that you're focused on, if you're allowing uh, cross pollination, it's not going to uh, give you as true to see, as true to the variety as uh, you could have. Um, and I guess if complete isolation isn't possible. You, you plant you should be at least isolated from from pollen that will increase the proportion of starchy kernels like 
So again, it could be a thing, you know, downwind uh, to to plant varieties you'd be concerned about contributing to uh, to start to your kernels. Uh, like even that's going to help, I guess, is what I'm saying. If complete isolation isn't possible. Um, the other thing, or one other thing that isolation will allow us uh, allow you to get is sort of the purity of, of color because again that trait is uh, apart from the pollen so you have a yellow corn or a white corn or a bicolor white yellow or a bicolor yellow darker yellow or or whatever it is if you have pollen that's outside of uh, of that variety you're gonna you're gonna get issues with not having as perfect the or not perfect but not having the same degree of color that was uh claimed so uh basically we this is getting a little technical here but i wanted to throw it in uh pollen from yellow or bicolor corn will cause some yellow kernels if you have a white variety but pollen from yellow corn will lead to extra yellow kernels in a bicolor and and those aren't 100% solid all the time. That's the vast majority of the time. That's what's going to happen. Uh, and pollen from white corn will not affect yellow or bicolor varieties. So I got my seed now. What's my planting strategy? Well, I I, I think you've got a couple of factors to consider here. Um, what? what's my plan for uh for her for marketing and once i have a marketing plan then i can come up with a harvesting plan but how how am i going to be marketing my corn and and soil temperature i guess are the the factors that i'm going to say we got to got to look at off the hop um <clears throat> excuse me generally it's uh it's quite fair to say that that sweet corn uh isn't tolerant to uh, cold soil. I, I think everybody can agree on that. Uh, minimum temperature for germination is around 55 Fahrenheit. If it's under that, you basically have a high failure rate or a 100% failure rate. It's that, That's the, the bare minimum. But once you bump that up, uh, sort of 18, 20, and up towards 24, that, that's kind of the ideal range uh, for, for germination. Now, if I'm growing sweet corn, part of what I'm going to be looking at is selecting varieties that uh, tolerate the cold better in the sense of seed germination. When I say tolerate cold, I'm not talking like frost on the uh, on the leaves and the cobs, but colder temperatures to get it out of the ground. Um, some varieties will generally germinate better, but the flip side is you're going to have lower yields. That seems to be genetically related in the uh, corn genome. So it sounds like that's my first planting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's one that you would target not for every planting, but target to have as your uh, early early season first mm -hmm. to market sort of thing. Um, now you stage your seeding in the sense of with your target harvest date in mind or continue or targeting a continual harvest. So when when you're in the winter deciding, you know, how am I getting rid of my corn? Am I uh, loading it up in uh, one week or two weeks and just uh, taking it all somewhere and I'm done? Or uh, am I uh, say selling at the end of my lane uh, as long as I have corn from the first first harvest right through till when it freezes and there's no more so that that's gonna gonna be a big factor in staging my seeding is is what is my marketing plan uh one way to do it is you could seed a combination of varieties that have different days to maturity Another way to uh, look at it would be to stagger seeding dates of a variety that has the same maturity date. Now, obviously, you're going to get a, a, a bigger window of time using the second one of those, staggering the seeding dates. 
but you know you could put a corn that has say a 70 day to for an example the first one a combination of varieties you could plant a 70 day uh maturing corn that tolerates the uh, the cold fairly well and uh and an 80 day or a 75 day one that doesn't uh isn't necessarily as uh tolerant of it but plant it at the same time and you're going to get at least probably five days if not uh longer in uh, maturity difference yeah I, I really confuse things i grow four hybrids <laughs> between uh about like 68 to 78 days yeah. and i do about three or four seeding dates yeah. so i've got a uh, complete mix yeah and and i think it goes to what your market is and uh what when you have that market what the feedback is from the people who you're selling to whether it's direct to consumer or uh into retail or or wherever it is um that that's a big part you got to listen to who's doing the buying so i think we kind of went over this here i'm not gonna we just talked about that so i'm gonna move on um you could uh seed the same variety at uh if we're talking about staggered seedings you could see seed the same variety at five to ten day intervals again depending on uh what you figure is your uh your amount of time you're going to uh need between uh harvest dates kind uh, of thing. i i find that that uh that could be in during the uh uh warm part of the year June. yes the early part of the year it's going to take 15, 20 days for some of those to come up. Yeah. So uh, the way that I was taught, one way, is you wait until you've got a first true leaf develop and then you're then in you there go... to see. And yeah, and that means that your, your staggering dates will vary from like 20 days yeah. to 15, to maybe down to 10 yeah. at the time you're doing your last seeding. So progressively uh, getting shorter mm -hmm. as the season goes on. And I, I think, like as, as a general rule, you know, if you wait until the previous seeding is somewhere around 50% emergence mm -hmm. uh, before seeding uh, that same variety, th that will allow for a, a continuous supply. You know, it, it's not a perfect rule, but most of the most of the time that that's a good rule of thumb, I guess. Um, we could uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, mapping out the field plan i guess here like how am i going to decide how to uh how, how to set up my planters and i don't want to sound like i'm copping out here but basically it depends on the scale of your operation it's going to be totally different if you're hand harvesting or if you're harvesting with a machine or or whatever so we got to look at different scenarios so let's say you're hand harvesting um, you're, we'd recommend you, you leave some unseeded rows to facilitate movement. Now, how far apart those unseeded rows are, uh, it'll depend. Are you uh, using a wheelbarrow? Are you carrying a garbage pail? Uh, I don't know what you're hauling your corn out with. Um, you know, th there's so many factors there, but generally speaking, every, uh, if you had like six, plus rows of corn and a blank row or two, that's gonna make it fairly easy for pickers to, to get up and down. Um, and I don't know how much, how many of you have ever really picked corn on those terribly hot, muggy, ugly, wet mornings, but if you have, you don't want unhappy pickers because they're bad enough as it is. So anything you can do to not frustrate them more, that's a good thing um another uh sort of thing you might want to think about if you're planning to leave empty rows for uh for pickers is do i want to line those empty rows up with where my ground rig would be going through the field like it would seem to only make sense if i have to <laughs> if i have to leave some rows why would i uh, not leave rows where you know i'm where where i'm going to be spraying driving anyway so it, it just makes sense um now when you're down in a real small acreage you know guys who uh might not be even having uh more than one planting date or maybe two 
you could get away with just planting smaller blocks. And I've seen a few where they just don't have any blank rows. They just come at it from uh, each side. Uh, walk in, you know, two, three rows and do a little bit of picking. And somebody comes from the other side and does that side. And you just keep bringing it out to the outside and moving down. So, uh, again, it kind of depends on your situation here. I, I wish it was like a recipe I could just tell you this is exactly what you do and it'll be perfect. Well, it's not, uh, you just have to uh, do what works in your situation. Now, if you're mechanically harvesting, if you're on a big enough scale to be mechanical harvesting, well, it just it really doesn't matter because the harvester's cutting out all the rows. So you, there's no need for, for blank rows there either as everything's removed. Okay, you're going to tell me what this is going to cost me now. <laughs> you know, when I'm buying my seed, every seed costs between one and a half and two cents per seed. Yeah, for sure. So, so you tell me how many I need here so I know how much it's going to cost me to plant acre. Well, yeah. And seed, the, the cost of seed is, is definitely uh, something that uh, corn growers know can get expensive. So... For a number of reasons, you don't want to overplant or underplant, but a good number in general to target, and I'm going to give some reasons for it coming up, is around 18 to 20,000 plants an acre. I think if, yeah, that well, let's just start with the generality. So yeah, 18 to 20,000. Um, if uh, if you were to have a much lower rate than that you're you're going to wind up with issues uh in in your crop and if you uh go the other way you're 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 going to stress the plants in, in other ways mind you but you're you're if you're too uh too tight you're uh if you've got more seed it's going to cause problems too so i i, I love selling Sweet corn against those people, Tom. They 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 will have 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 cobs the size of your thumb because it's too thick, and I can outsell them any day of the week. I find the thin stand uh, will produce much more market acceptable cobs than overseeding. Right, and the question then comes: the thin stand is producing cobs, but at what cost? In the sense of economics, like your number of cobs per acre your yield is down, the question is how much? And that's for a little experimentation on everybody's farm with the variety, because that range 18 to 20,000 plants an acre, like a thousand or 2,000 plants an acre makes a world of difference uh, in cob size. So you certainly can play around a little bit. Um, when you plant uh, too wide, you're going to wind up with uh, more tillers, a little bit uh, lower yield. You're going to get uh, poor weed competition, and all that can contribute to uh, reductions in quality, yield, vigor. But as John mentioned, it you're going to get more marketable cobs if you're too wide apart than if you're too tight in spacing. Especially in dry soil like oh. I am. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of water to spare. Yeah. Um, now, ha having said all this, you know, s some varieties and you, I guess I didn't say this at the beginning when John asked me about selecting varieties. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm slamming uh, salespeople here, but we, we got to be careful with what we read in an online catalog or what a salesman tells us. Uh, I'm not saying it isn't true, but to take everything with a bit of a grain of salt, I guess is, is what I'm saying. So if somebody tells you they got a great sweet corn variety, full cobs and it's 50 days to maturity, don't buy 10 acres worth of it right off the hop, buy a few and plant it and see what you get. But uh, the odds are it's going to take a little more than 50 days is all I'm saying to get to maturity. So anyway, so some varieties are going to need a, uh, a higher population. 
and you should play around with a smaller amount though don't uh jump off the cliff and plant your whole farm to something new variety with a radically different uh, spacings uh Okay, so we got the planter in the field, Tom. How, how deep am I going to bury this stuff? Well, okay. Again, generally speaking, the deeper you see, the, the cooler the soil. And uh, basically, uh, you, you want to seed to moisture within reason. If the moisture is down seven inches, I'm not saying <laughs> seed to moisture. I'm saying maybe wait. Or... Oh, I'm not seeding anything. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so later season seeding generally can be deeper because the soils are warmer. Um, however, the recommended target, you know, if I had to pick a number, I, I'd, I'd go an inch and a half. Some people might say an inch, but I'd, I'd go an you inch. You don't go too shallow. You don't get development of your nodal roots yeah. in the soil and it'll flop over. So eventually I'd stick yeah. at your one and a half inches. Yep. So I wouldn't give it. Yep, so I, I I agree with that. And the the one thing though, when when I'm saying you know depths up to two and a half or three, you're it it's going to take longer to come out of the ground in the sense that there's more soil on top of it. But it does need moisture to germinate. You can lay corn into dry ground all you want, and other than feeding the birds and whatever, you're not really doing much. So, um, I. I'd be worried if I had to go deeper than about three inches, I, I guess is, is my concern here. Um, and I think we just talked about that, that if we get too deep, we're uh, gonna be whooping ourselves later on. So I guess too, when it comes to reasons for, uh, for poor seedling emergence and management, there's a lot of things to look at here. Uh, most of them aren't that huge a deal. Uh, timing and temperature, just as an example. Uh, we talked about this earlier on, 55 Fahrenheit and uh, below, you're, you're basically gonna have no germination. So uh, seed a little bit later, let the soils warm up. Uh, soil moist. Uh, but, but I want to catch that early market. So you're going to cheat a little bit. You're, I, I, I've done that in the past. Yeah. It's okay to cheat because if it if it's a wreck, you always have a chance to seed it later. Yeah. So if you're making your money on the first marketplace, I'd suggest cheating a little bit. And if it if it fails, well then that you work it up and that becomes your last seeding. Yeah. And and I think there that goes to the the general uh, mentality of uh, people who are out there growing crops. You know, you got to push it a little bit. There, you, you if you were going to be safe, you wouldn't be growing anything because there's no guarantee to start with there. Um, okay, so uh, talked about the soil moisture we need for emergence. Dry soils uh, delay slash halt uh, germination and uh, excess moisture will uh, potentially uh, cause some uh, issues with disease. Uh, so here it's timing your seeding as best as possible to, to maximize emergence. Now, there's no guarantees there, but uh, like John says, you know, pushing it uh, a little bit, you 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 have to basically because uh, if 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 you're getting say a quarter of your income up front from a better price at the first sales, you know, you you want to be one of those guys who has it in first. Um, other reasons for poor emergence: we got pests. And predation. So sweet corn, geez, that's a it's a prime target for uh foraging animals, birds. Uh John heard here he's gonna go through some of those control measures later in uh, the webinar, probably the second part. Um insect pests of concern here. Uh I'd say uh cutworms, uh 
seed corn maggots are probably right uh, right there. John Gavlosky, did you want to throw in a, a comment or two? Yes, I certainly can. We'll have to switch over to my screen if that's okay. I don't have that control, but Lori does. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Not yet, John. Oh, okay. I have to wait for Lori to. Yeah, I've sent uh, you a request to present. Um... So you should get a prompt, John. And you're going to share a screen? You do that again, Lori. I don't have anything here. Okay. Okay, I can see that. Now uh, you can see my screen? Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Now we just have to get my slides to advance and we will be in good shape here. Here we go. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to cover actually three different insects that uh, will feed on corn early in the season. Cutworms are probably the um, biggest concern in Manitoba. And when I say cutworms, cutworms doesn't refer to a species, it refers to a group of species. And recently we've had two of them that have been an issue in corn and other crops. Um, redback cutworm is probably the most common one. Um, it is one of the species that we consider a clipper. So they will actually clip the stems of the plants when they get to be older larvae. Now the other one I've got on my screen here, dingy cutworm. This one's what we call a climbing cutworm. So they will climb up and nibble away at the plants do some defoliation, go back in the ground. They don't do a lot of clipping. So if you have dingy cutworm, you'll see defoliation, but you won't see cut plants. So it's not as obvious that it's cutworm damage. If that seems to be happening, dig around the plants and uh, have a look at what's happening around the plants. See if you can find the cutworms. Uh, there are foliar sprays, um, there are there are uh, seed treatments that can be used in corn as well so you do have a few options now a few things to consider though if you do find some heavy cutworm problems first of all cutworms can be very patchy so it might not be your whole uh corn patch that needs to be treated uh see if it's maybe just a portion of the patch where the cutworms are an issue if you do if you are using insecticides um, you may be able to get away with just treating a patch. The other thing to note with cutworms, they're nocturnal, they feed at night, they hide during the day. So again, if you are having to control them, evening spraying, if you are spraying, does work better because they are nocturnal and they're coming up at night to feed. And there's a lot of things that will try to help control your cutworm populations if you have enough of them around. Uh, one of them is ground beetles. So this is a ground beetle in the picture here. Sometimes they're solid black, other times they're solid brown. Sometimes they got patterns like this. Uh, we've actually got over 300 different types of these ground beetles in Manitoba, lots of different species. There's over 900 species in Canada, very diverse group, love eating cutworms. Uh, this one here actually in the picture, this was our lab pet Peter from a couple summers ago. And uh, we, the summer students, were throwing in several cutworms and grubs per day to keep Peter fed so uh, they can eat a lot of prey when they're abundant. Uh, other things that'll feed on cutworms, there's some insects that look almost like bumblebees. They're called bee flies. They will parasitize cutworms. Uh, there's another group of flies called tachinid flies. They look like house flies with hairy abdomens. Uh, they will lay eggs into uh, the cutworms as well, and there's parasitic wasps that will affect them. One of the things that will take a population down as well is fungal pathogens. If the soil's damp for prolonged periods, sometimes the cutworm population gets diseased, and that's not healthy for them. 
Now, cutworms will feed above and below ground, depending on the species. There's another group called the wireworms, and these are a bit different. With wireworms, it's the juveniles. So on the uh, left in your screen is the juvenile stage. These feed only below ground. They never come above the surface. So uh, once you've seeded your crop, management-wise, it's really hard to do anything about them. Um, seeding when you can get very uh, quick germination and early growth is helpful because that gives the, uh, the wireworms less of a chance to really do a lot of damage. So anything that you can do to get that quick early growth is really helpful. Now, for anybody who uh, does want to try to control wireworms, suppose you've had an area that has had bad wireworm issues for a few years, you want to bring the population down. Do note that the, uh, the seed treatments that are on the market, your cruisers and um, your ponchos and things like that, they make wireworms sick, they don't kill them. There is a new product on the market uh, it just came out this year. It's called Semigra Broflanoline, the active ingredient. It's registered in all types of corn, so sweet and field corn. And you would apply this in furrow, um, and it will control either wireworms or corn rootworms should you have them. And it's also registered in potatoes, this product. So it's really the only product on the market right now for corn that would actually kill the wireworms. Now, when you're doing your looking around and see if you've got wireworms or cutworms, do note that there's other things in the soil that are not harmful to your crop that could easily be confused with wireworms. And one that I'm profiling here, this is a, a white fly larva. These are called therivid flies or stiletto flies. They're very hairy, very light gray, hairy flies. And their larva can be quite long. And they're very active. If you were to poke this therivid larva, they will go snaky. They will squirm like crazy. They're very active. They will feed on things such as wireworms. So these are good guys. So if it looks like a wireworm, kind of, but it's too pale, doesn't have any legs, squirms a lot when you poke at it, those are therivids. Those are good. You don't need to be doing anything. There's also smaller pale white worms you will sometimes find in the soil. They're called enchitrid worms. They're, they're much tinier and uh, they're almost uh, translucent. You can almost see right into them. So if you're finding a lot of those, those are good guys too. They help decompose your stubble, but they're not pests. So just make sure you're uh, scouting properly. And the final one I'll cover here is seed corn maggot. So seed corn maggots, these are flies that, um, they're attracted to the smell of decomposition. So if you've just recently put manure onto a field, that would be attractive to seed corn maggot flies. If you've just incorporated a cover crop or uh, plowed in a very weedy field, that decomposing plant material could attract the flies as well. Usually two or three weeks after you've uh, worked the plant material in or applied the manure, it, the field is much less attractive to the seed corn maggots. But right afterwards, they could be attracted in. Now, their larva will feed on decomposing organic matter, but they will sometimes get right into the corn seeds. This picture here is actually a bean seed, but they'll do the same thing in corn. Um, some of them, instead of just feeding on organic matter, will get right inside the seeds, and you might end up with uh, what looks like poor germination. And if you suspect this could be happening, dig up some seeds, split some and look inside and see if you have the seed corn maggots. So those are really your, your three major concerns as far as early season insect pests in corn. So I'll turn okay. it back to you, Tom. Yep, thank you, John. Um, thank you, Lori, for <laughs> your head of me again. Okay. So we'll just get the one here. There we are. Now, the next part I want to kind of move into is the diseases. Uh, when we're talking about poor emergence, uh, seed rot damping off can affect uh, seedlings in, in corn, well, as well as in other crops, but certainly in. Uh, in sweet corn and uh, cause the emerging uh, sprouts to 
at a bare minimum, be less vigorous or even die off uh, to reduce the issues. So sow the seed as shallow as you can and into warmer warm soils, and that'll help to reduce the incidence and severity of uh, of these problems. Uh, Vikram, do you have uh, comments you'd like to make regarding uh, diseases and uh, poor seedling emergence? You'll need to unmute yourself, Vikram. Uh, yeah, Lori, thank you very much. And I am going to get my screen share. Oh, where is that? I sent you the prompt to do that. There you go. And if you want to open up your presentation, we see your desktop. And go to that display settings at the top, please, Vikram. And swap. And swap. Please. Yep. Okay, good. All right. Uh, I have uh, some of the uh, few comments on what can cause uh, to uh, poor emergence. Uh, it is not just uh, the diseases, but there may be other factors included. So I'll uh, comment on a couple of other things as well. So here's the uh, next one. So some of the issues could be related to old seed, and I'm sure uh, uh, John Hurd will be uh, talking about the testing of the seed germination. So if you're using some leftover seed, it is very important to uh, understand that. Uh, I give all my leftover seed to you to use, Vikram. Yeah, and uh, if you use the leftover seed without testing for the germination, uh, you can get anywhere from 5 10% to 50% germination, and uh, then you have to plant it again. So a free gift from John is often not free. Uh, also, in some cases, we have untreated seed being planted. Uh, that may lead to its own problems because uh, seed treatments are one of the best uh, and cheapest uh, things to uh, protect your crop right from the beginning. If you do not have enough plants, uh, you know, you can do very little to uh, increase your potential productivity. Uh, cold soils are uh, the other problem. So some of the uh, people may be thinking, you know, I want to beat the market and plant ASAP. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it feels that the air is good. Uh, I can walk out in my shorts. And so they go plant. Uh, not realizing that about uh, uh, 12 inches uh, below the ground, it is still frozen. So those soils, when they thaw, are going to keep the soils very cold for quite some time. When the plants emerge slowly, they are prone to infection by some of the pathogens which are in the soil. And they are adapted to infecting stressed out seedlings. Uh, poorly drained soils is another uh, issue that uh, could lead to uh, poor emergence. And, uh, you know, if your soil is poorly drained, the water isn't moving out, your soil stays uh, wet. Uh, some of these uh, pathogens, uh, the pythium especially, they love wet soils and uh, the spores that are produced are mobile in the water film and they uh, hone in to the uh, root uh, exudates from the uh, corn and other seedlings. So uh, drainage is a very important thing. Herbicide could be another issue where uh, I think uh, uh, Kim Brown may be talking a bit more on what could happen. I may have a few more comments later. Uh, here is uh, a photograph of uh, the uh, seedling, which is going to have tough time coming out because this uh, soil surface, you can see is so wet. 
and you can also see the mycelial mat and the mycelium is growing very well uh, the seedling is going to have tough time uh, finally making it into a, a good plant so cool wet soils is going to be a problem and uh, replanting in the same spot uh, of a small garden is uh, uh, not a good idea and again drainage is an important thing uh, corn seedling rods again poor rotation poor drainage and in some cases uh, fertilizer could be an issue when we think you know uh, the more the better and you uh, put uh, heavier doses or when you ban it is too close to the seed and so some of the uh, roots may be burning off so uh, one has to be rather careful probably john will uh, cover this uh, topic a bit more later on the four r's and here are some of the fungicide treatments that uh, are uh, very uh, effective some of these uh, fungicides are covered in our uh, guide to crop protection and here i have given that uh, if you notice certain problems and you have sent these samples to the lab and they say it is pythium or rhizoctonia then based on that you can order your seed uh, with specific uh, treatments and uh, you know i will not recommend any specific uh, treatment uh, here but uh, there are uh, uh, cases where uh, you are unable to treat the material yourself there are one or two uh, fungicides for seed treatment that uh, you can treat yourself and whiter flow is uh, one of them and uh, coincidentally whiter flow is also effective against uh, head smut and i'm going to talk to you in a few seconds uh, john just uh, gave me a packet of uh, uh, strokes seeds this is uh, a hybrid and it is very uh, clearly uh, treated with the uh, fungicide and it is treated with the uh, carboxin, maxim, metal XL, thyram. So it has a very good uh, fungicide uh, seed treatment, which is basically all you need. And so uh, in most cases, if you have a good soil, uh, good drainage, uh, you should not have any emergence issues. And if you do, it is important to figure out what it could be uh, for next year. So this is the picture of smut of corn, which is caused uh, by, our, uh, by a fungus, which is seed born, but is also uh, crop residue uh, born, or it overwinters in the crop residue. So in this case, the galls can form in most part of the plant and seed treatment, vita flow is uh, very important and helpful. And if possible, if you have a small uh, place, uh, remove the infected uh, plants and uh, burn them and uh, you have a, a solution. So I have a few other points which mostly related to the herbicide. So it could be uh, quite often I get called, you know, why my plants are dying, they have come up. Uh, it could be that somebody sprayed glyphosate on uh, the uh, plants and uh, they didn't realize that it was not a glyphosate resistant uh, variety and so it is extremely important that we realize uh, what traits some of these things have i think i'll stop at that because uh, this goes into uh, kim brown's territory and uh, she may want to uh, talk more about that thank you Thanks, Vikram. <clears throat> Thank you, Laurie. So Vikram uh, sort of touched on uh, concepts there a little bit. Uh, and herbicide residues uh, potentially are going to uh, cause issues with germination and emergence. Uh, 
And I guess there, just make sure you know history of where your uh, what was on those uh, those acres in the past year or two, because um, certainly nowadays there are some uh, some fairly commonly used chemicals out there that uh, could affect uh, sweet corn. Um, And Vikram has touched on these. Uh, here are some of the, I'm just kind of motoring through them, some of the diseases that are going to potentially uh, show up in sweet corn in Manitoba. We uh, will cover them at a later date uh, during the uh, later session. Yep, that's the plan. Okay. And uh, here, we'll just move here. So. From my perspective, when we're trying to decide about how many acres to plant, it comes down to the marketing plan. We sort of talked about that a little bit when we were uh, trying to decide, am I gonna stagger my plantings or what am I gonna do? So, am I selling for a full season, a couple of weeks? What am I doing? Uh, general target, very generalized ballpark figure. You can tell by the words I'm using that it is just an estimate. Thousand dozen an acre would be a ballpark uh, estimate. Um, some growers I've spoken with go as low as 800, some uh, go as high as 1200 uh, dozen an acre, but a thousand is certainly uh, a, a decent uh, target, not uh, ridiculously high and uh, certainly uh, not overly uh, low either. Um, you should be should consider, depending on your marketing uh, plan, I mean, to factor in a cushion. And when I'm saying cushion in quotes, I, I, I don't want that to be like a huge percentage because sometimes farmers, they, they don't, make the best economic decisions because they want to grow things and to have a uh, you know 10 percent uh, extra plants that yeah it's going to cost a little bit but it's not the end of the world but if if i have double the acreage i need that's uh that puts a lot of pressure on me to sell more which uh as we get into the second part of the webinar next week i'm going to be telling you and Never devalue the cost of your your corn. Don't cut the price. Um, it's not worth it. So anyway, um, just be cognizant of not over planting. Oh, you know, 10%, not bad, but don't go much more than that. Um, what types of yield, I often get asked, you know, what, what's, what types of yields can I get in, in the best case scenario? Well, I'd be curious to know from everybody out there through uh, through the question and answer or the chat or however you want to do it, what they've heard of yields. The highest yield I ever heard of was 2,000 dozen an acre. Um, that year, though, conditions were just perfect. This was an irrigated grower. Um, it just was unbelievable how good the year was there. And I'm not saying that's nearly the average or anything. Big red note at the bottom. This is like a pretty small plot and it was a trial of a variety. So, but it just shows it can be done. It's not the norm, but it can be done. Um, another question that comes up a lot is uh, carrying over seed. We sort of talked about, I, I, I mentioned that, uh, a, a little bit earlier on when I said don't overbuy seed just to get a volume discount if you're not using it in that year. Um, the germination will start to drop off and I wouldn't advise storing seed for longer than one year. Plus if I did store it for one year, I'd do a germination test on it before I uh, used it. Uh, because if the germination is uh, reduced significantly, it's going to whack the heck out of the population, which will affect yield and quality down the road. So uh, basically low germination, which can happen even after one year, your stand's going to be uh, affected and uh, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to affect uh, 
expect yield more than quality probably on the on the low end. It's not like when you have a tighter stand, you're going to get more quality effects. But well, well but, but, but I'm a Scotsman, and and, and, and uh, uh, other than giving my bad seed away to Vikram, uh, I want to make use of it if yeah. I've got it. So uh, uh, I, I want to do a test. Yeah. And if it's good, I'll keep it. But but my plan is I always seed my my fresh seed first because it'll have the vigor and the germ. Yeah. And I keep any leftover seed. That's what I see in June plantings, warm, moist soils, piece of cake to emerge. Yeah. So I target where I'm going to use that stuff yeah. and bump the population accordingly. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that, that's probably a really smart way to look at it in the sense of if you're holding seed back, uh, or sorry, if you've carried seed over and that certainly uh, used newer seed earlier on when getting it out of the ground is uh, an issue to begin with, um and use uh, carried over seed later on my thing is I, I don't take a chance if you do a germ test and it's it's low depending on how much money you think you're going to spend for your scottish uh heritage there you know bite the bullet but if you're going to do it do a uh do do a germination test and to do a germination test pretty simple Start out with a, a known number of seeds. It uh, doesn't matter what that number is. Uh, say 50. I don't care. Uh, wrap them in uh, a paper towel that's moist, but not dripping wet. Like we don't want these to rot. We want to have enough moisture to mimic soil, moist soil. We don't want it to be the bathtub wet. Um, put that moist uh, paper towel wrapped up in, in a container. Um, keep the container where it's warm. I'd use uh, 20 Celsius. I wouldn't want to have it too terribly warm or you might get uh, artificially high germination. Um, keep it there for a week. Open up those uh, paper towels and, and count them. You get the number of germinated seeds and divide by the total seeds times it by 100 and you get a percent. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, John had some pictures here, uh, basically wrapped up uh, seed and then the open uh, package uh, or open wrapping there where you can see some sprouted and some not. And if we go in a little closer here, you can see uh, some sprouted. Uh, those, those seeds on the right, those are the ones that I uh, sell to Vikram. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I have had some experience with John's old corn seed, and you certainly need to, uh, or low germ corn seed, I should say. You certainly need to have uh, have quite a bit of uh, potential extra planting, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's just looking looking at that. Now treating the own seed. Uh, doesn't really come into play. I don't know, Vikram, did you want to talk about that at all or what's your thought? No, I I covered that in the yep. uh, earlier thing. In most cases, commercial seed is treated, so the growers don't have to. But uh, in case they want to treat, there are only a couple of uh, seed treatment fungicides uh, that may be uh, available as an option. So uh, in most cases, check the label and uh, do accordingly. Right on, thank you. Um, basically, in my way of thinking, if I'm buying seed and yes uh, to uh, anyone with Scottish heritage of which I'm a quarter as well, so I'm not slamming somebody who I'm not, you may not want to spend the money, but in reality, purchase seed you're getting a known tested germination. You've got purity to variety. Uh, I'm gonna have to be saving quite a bit to be motivated to, uh, to, to plant something with poor germination. Um, so anyway, that's, I don't wanna rant, but that's, uh, that's sort of my thing there. Um, I'm just gonna check the, chat or the questions here see if i can see anything 
Uh, so I'm not seeing any uh, any questions in there. Hello, John. Uh, Tom, I had a question. Okay. Uh, some of the seed that John gave me, if he had uh, kept it in a cooler instead of at room temperature in his garage or in a freezer, would it have performed better? Uh, I'm going to say yes, it would have done somewhat better, but uh, no guarantee how much better. Does that... Uh... Is that too much of a cop out? Because I I don't know how to quantify it, but you know, generally, and you'd still have uh, the ability to uh, to test it for germination and see what uh, how good or bad it is. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna check here. Questions? No, I'm not seeing any any questions uh, come on out there show us a sign of life is there anyone <laughs> listening or not well we did we did have one that i answered in the uh in the question itself here if you scroll down a little bit uh, tom there is one um regarding okay. any suggestions on controlling picnic beetle in corn this is for john john g okay uh, i call those beer bugs but uh john you suck it to them Okay, yeah, so they're a tricky one. So uh, the, the the proper common name we use is sap beetles. And I do have a slide of a sap beetle. If uh, if we want to, we can go to my screen, Laurie, so I can show people what we're talking about. Just give me a sec here. Oh, sorry. There we go. So these are what we're talking about. These are, some people call them picnic bugs. Sap beetles, the, the proper term. Um, sap beetles like things that are decomposing. So when they get into corn, often they're getting in when the silks are starting to ferment. And that, uh, that, that, that smell of fermentation is what really will draw them to your, your corn. And, as some of you know, they once they get in there, they will sometimes get into the cob. There's very little you can do. The, the problem is there's really nothing registered that you could spray, and you you don't want to be spraying corn that you're going to be picking uh, too soon anyway. Um, but seeing as they, they do like decomposing things, uh, if you are composting, material uh don't don't have if it's a garden situation uh don't have your compost bin right next to your garden um now there might be some reasons why you like doing that because it's easy to transfer the compost onto your garden but that uh decomposing material is what will help attract sap beetles to the area so if, if they are an issue um that's one way you can manage it uh, other than that, they're a very tricky thing to deal with. They they don't really do a lot of um, economic damage as far as yield goes, but it's a a, um, a quality thing, a, a I guess grossness factor thing. People just don't like seeing uh, bugs in their corn. And what I'm showing you here, um, I this was actually a, a corn uh, cob that was taken out of a compost pile where I took this picture. Uh, you you really. So my picture here doesn't really represent what they would do to corn. They may nibble away at a few kernels, but they don't usually do a lot of serious damage to the kernel itself. Uh, John, John here, I, I, I deal with the beggars too, and there's two things I've noticed that help. Uh, one is if, if for some reason there was a poor crop of corn or dropped cobs around you, uh, they tend to, uh, and, and if they've been worked in the soil, those buried cobs or cobs on the surface tend to keep the population higher. Uh, I, I read that out of the Ohio fact sheets. So I've noticed that. I've had bad luck when I have uh, a lot of dropped cobs the previous year. And the other thing is, uh, Tom mentioned, is variety selection. And I used to grow Northern Extra Super Sweet, and those darn cobs would grow right out the end of the husk. And that left 
the corn exposed to these little beggars. And so try to select uh, hybrids that have good husk cover and that will uh, keep uh, uh, at least uh, thwart their uh, entry into the cobs. Good comment. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning about the buried uh, stocks, John, because there was actually a research study done in Harrow, Ontario, where they were looking at um, corn cobs as a breeding source for sap beetles. And they did find that buried corn cobs were one of the most attractive things for sap beetles to be laying their eggs into and breeding. So, uh, yeah, that's one way you could try to reduce the risk somewhat is not have a lot of uh, old buried cobs in the soil. Hi, uh, can I uh, put a comment here? Are you able to use uh, rotting fruit baits or apple vinegar bait to draw away some of these uh, beetles? Uh, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, I know people do attempt to do that in other crops. Uh, sap beetles are also an issue in raspberries and some other fruit crops. And I know people will attempt to do that. And I won't say that it works completely, but it uh, it might help somewhat. You you do end up attracting them to any, anything decomposing really can help attract them and keep at least some of them away. The problem is if the crop is also attractive, then you will end up with some in there. Uh, Vikram, I was just going to mention that in something small like a garden, uh, you could bait them with uh, uh, some wine and detergent and they'll, and they'll drown. And uh, uh, it seems to me you brew up wine that works really well for that purpose. <laughs> some of that wine I give to you free. <laughs> Oh boy. Yes, it has worked at least uh, in my, uh, you know, few meters of uh, grapes where it can be a big issue. Uh, I tried that and it worked very well for me. Okay, right on. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Vikram, John. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit we're running a little late but that's just because i talk too much um we're, we're gonna try to get through one more unit for sure unit two to do with uh weed management and uh to that end uh kim what why do i get so many weeds in my sweet corn like what's the deal there can you can you give us some some ideas um, hi, Tom. Um, there's several. <laughs> uh, in general, um, I'm just calling it my presentation here. Can you guys see that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and in general, basically, um, hang on. Whoops. My slides are not advancing. Just click your screen, Kim, and activate your slide deck. Just um, click the screen that you're advancing on it's yeah i can't it's not working <clears throat> can you move your cursor over to that screen no <laughs> no it's not working okay whoops sorry it'll all work out don't um, worry i've just lost most things now are you I using are you using dual, dual screens kim yes it's, okay, so if you put your cursor to the top of the screen that your cursor is on right now and move it across the top, don't try the sides. No, no, that's not going to work. Oh. Hmm? I know, but I can't get my cursor in there. It won't go on. The yeah, screen. sometimes it needs to come across the top, top oh, of the screen. Okay. 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 You're there now. Okay. Now quick. Quick. okay. There you yeah, go. There I am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. John Hurt has fixed both Johns. John Hurt and John Gavlowski were fixing my screen. Two Johns are better than one. There we go. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, it's basically it's an uncompetitive crop. So weed control will be challenging no matter what you do. Um, you can do absolutely everything right, and it's going to be very challenging. 
um, you the, one of the biggest things is it's a lower plant population than grain corn. It's about half of the population. And grain corn itself is not competitive until quite a bit later in the season. Um, so when you're dealing with half as many plants, there just isn't that opportunity for them to grow um, and shade the rows and kind of become competitive. So that's really the biggest thing um, is just it's not a competitive crop um, just due to its physical nature. Um, and another thing is there's pretty limited herbicide options. Mostly what we're using is um, veteran chemistries and um, they're quite old corn herbicides that we've had around for quite a while. Um, they're just not, you know, there just isn't a lot of uh, herbicide options to deal with in this crop. Um, yeah, so what's the recipe? Um, I guess it's fairly simple. You have to start clean. You have to, have to, have to start clean. Uh, you need to do that with a combination of things. Um, there's tillage, you can use burn-off chemistries, and I'll get to all this in a minute. Um, residual weed control products where you can use them, uh, that would be a really good idea because that buys you, um, it holds some of the weeds back for a little while, and allows that crop to get going. Your in-crop herbicide options are, again, are fairly limited. And beyond that, you have mechanical weed control. So you've got a rotary hoe, and then once that crop is up, you've got inter-row cultivation for as long as you can until the corn gets big enough and you start you know, physically damaging it by, by driving over top of it. So um, yeah, so if we're looking at burn-offs, and basically these really don't have a lot of residual control or have very, very little residual control if they have any, there's a number and most of them would include either glyphosate or glyphosate, which is Roundup, um, or glyphosate um, plus some of these um, chemistries. So if you look in your guide to crop protection, your field crop protection guide, there is a, a burn off a table in there for these burn offs and clean start, which is glyphosate, which I've abbreviated there to say just DLY, and, and carfentrazone, and that's groups nine and 14. It's really important to know your herbicide grouping from, for resistance management. I know you may not have a lot of acres of sweet corn, but you do have other crops coming onto that land at some point. And uh, we have to be really careful about herbicide resistant weeds and not having them on our farm or if they are, if they do get to our farm, then we want to, um, you know, limit their spread and certainly limit their spread among on, on our own farm and then also to surrounding fields as well. So it's really important to know what herbicide groups you've got and you're working with. Uh, glyphosate itself uh, is a group nine chemistry. I would do my very best to never spray glyphosate alone. I would um, want, you would want to preserve this molecule as long as you can. We do have glyphosate resistant weeds in Manitoba, um, things like our kochia, and, um, and there's some other weeds here that uh, water hemp as well. And there's other glyphosate weeds present in other geographical areas. So we want to be really careful to, um, to try to preserve glyphosate as long as we can and always try to have something in with that glyphosate. But you can spray glyphosate up until, you know, up, um, up until ground crack on corn. You do not want to be spraying anything with glyphosate once that corn is even poking up out of the ground because glyphosate is a systemic chemical, which means it gets in that plant and it will kill it. Uh, some of these other um, products are either broadleaf products or they are um, just a straight contact herbicide and they will not, they don't translocate, they don't move inside that baby corn plant, so um, they don't do nearly as much damage, but you do not want to spray glyphosate once that ground has, you, once the corn starts to come up, you shouldn't be spraying glyphosate anymore unless it happens to be like a Roundup tolerant uh, corn. Uh, AIM, EC, is carfentrazone, which is a group 14. Basically, if you would put that together with glyphosate, that would be basically like your clean start. Um, you can use uh, glyphosate and bromoxanol, or basically Bactril M, um, prior to the crop coming out. And that is a, a combination of group 9 and also group 6 and group 4, which is good. Uh, Goldwing, uh, which is a newer chemistry for us. It's called pyroflufen plus MCPA. And again, you would want to be spraying that with glyphosate as well. We would tank mix that, and that's a group 14 and a four. So that's a nice group. Those group 14s are newer chemistries for us, 
and it's good to start using those where we can. Uh, glyphosate and heat, uh, which has been around for a while, that's another good burn off product. Um, and that's saflufenacil, that's groups nine and 14. And then also even glyphosate and MCPA up front, that's group nine and group four. So that's gonna get you, you know, that's gonna do a good job to keep that soil black up front, but you're really not getting any residue coming from any of those that's not going to um, affect any more weeds. So the weeds that are there are going to get uh, killed, but the weeds that are coming after that are definitely, uh, we're going to have to do something about that. So when we're looking at residual weed control, I think some of us are familiar with atrazine or atrex. It's uh, liquid, liquid atrazine. That's a group five chemistry. Um, you're looking to control wild oats. That's really the only grass that you're going to get any control of. Um, but also like your broadleaf weeds and some of the ones that can get quite big and quite ugly that I know are a problem with in corn, your lamb's quarters, your wild buckwheat, your mustards. So this is going to do a good job on your volunteer canola, but anything in that mustard family. So, you know, your wild mustard, um, there's a number of different um, mustard weeds. So that basically that whole family, including your, your volunteer canola, and it will should get all of all types of your volunteer canola, like all of your different herbicide tolerant volunteer canolas, um, your red root pigweed, your ragweed, your smartweed as well. Um, it's a PPI generally, um, which is pre-plant incorporated, but you actually you can use it post as well. So you can use it once the corn is up. Corn is very tolerant to atrazine, uh, so it just depends how you want to use that there. Um, if you're going, there's a, 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 a lot of different rates you can use this with. Um, if you're tank mixing it with glyphosate, you tend to use a bit of a lower rate, but if you're um, at the higher rates on its own, um, you would have to watch your recropping. So what, uh, your canola and your oats, um, basically you'd have to be careful what you're growing following the sweet corn the year after applying those high rates of, of atrazine. But if you're tank mixing it with glyphosate, um, and the lower rates, um, you know, you're using a third to a half a liter of atrazine with your glyphosate, it's, that's not going to cause you any problems. And um, you can tank mix it with dual 2 magnum as well, which I will talk about right away. So dual 2 magnum is um, one of our veteran corn herbicides. It's metolachlor group 15. So again, a different herbicide group than we've been seeing used on the farm in other crops, which is not nice because that's um, really helpful to have some of these different groups on farm to, um, uh, to help us with herbicide resistance. So it's going to do a good job on your foxtails, your green and your yellow foxtails, your barnyard grass as well. And then after that, we start looking at our, our broadleaf weeds, like our nightshade. This is a very good water hemp pro uh, product, and uh, we've been seeing more use of this because of that water hemp coming into Manitoba. We, de we have Water hemp here, it's a very aggressive uh, weed in the amaranth family, which is very similar. It's related to red root pigweed. Uh, it produces a lot of seeds. And right now the water hemp in Manitoba is resistant to group nine and group two, which is glyphosate and your group two chemistry. And in other places, it's resistant to up to seven different chemical groups. So we really have to watch this water hemp and that is something to be really careful of anyways. Um, but anyways, dual two magnum is starting to see a little bit more use because it is a good water hemp product. You'll also get suppression of red root pigweed, lamb's quarters and your mustards as well. Um, it can be a PPI, which is a pre-plant incorporated. So you'd want to incorporate that, good, you know, between two to four inches, you need to get that in there. Or it can be used as a pre-emergent where you don't incorporate. But if you don't incorporate it, you're going to have to have moisture in order to activate it. It's fairly stable. It doesn't really break down in the sunlight, but you're going to have to have, uh, I think it's about a half an inch um, when um, you're going to have to uh, have about a half an inch of moisture to get that moving down into that soil, or you're not going to see the weed control. So uh, PPI or pre-plant incorporated is kind of when kind of a, a, a good way to, to make sure we're going to get that chemistry to work for us. And it can be tanked with atrazine um, and glyphosate um, as well when it's PPI. Sorry, I missed a spot, missed a word there. Um, Post-emergent herbicides. Now, atrazine, again, we talked about it as a, as a pre-plant, but you can go up to um, one to six leaf stage on the corn or when the corn is less than 12 inches tall. Uh, you need to add an oil concentrate or a crop oil, so you have to have that. 
if you're spraying in colder weather, that may cause crop injury. And in hot, dry weather, we tend to see it not work quite as well on the weeds. Um, and you can mix it with bromoxynol, but you don't need you don't use the oil in that case. Um, one thing, uh, another older corn herbicide that has been used in Manitoba for a while um, is Accent, and this is a group two, a Nicosulfuron. And it's a it's a uh, grass herbicide, um, but it's very good. Um, it's uh, very safe from the one to six leaf stage on emerged corn. Um, it'll do your wild oat. It does your green and yellow foxtail, your barnyard grass, and it has activity on quack grass as well. If you have that problem, you can tank mix it with Pardner, which is bromoxynol, and recropping to most crops is fine. So this is a nice chemistry to use because really you don't have any recropping issues for most of the crops that you guys will be going back. Um, Armazon, this is a newer chemistry for us. This is a group 27. It's uh, topramazone. Uh, there's another uh, name in the guide. Um, I didn't call it Armazon. That's what I know it as, but there is another brand name of topramazone. And we, you can spray this one up to the one to seven leaf stage of your corn. Um, very good chemistry for volunteer canola, your pigweeds, your mustards, your kochia, and it also gets suppression of your barnyard grass, your green and yellow foxtail, your Weed, your lamb's quarters and your lady's thumb. So those problematic weeds, you'll get suppression of those ones with Armazon, but it does a very good job on volunteer canola and the pig weeds as well. Um, it needs to be tank mixed with Atrex or Atrazine. And again, recropping to most crops is fine as long as that uh, level of Atrazine doesn't get too high. And again, we'd be watching our canola and our oats probably following that. So Bazagran um, is registered It's um, for post-emergent in corn. It doesn't get used a lot, but it can be used. Um, it's a chemical name, it's Bentazon. It's a group six chemistry, so it's a similar chemistry to bromoxanol, which is our partner. Um, it really, it doesn't have any staging restrictions, so it's quite safe on the corn at any stage. It does broadleaf weeds, it does a number of broadleaf weeds, um, but it really works best on really small weeds. And our group six chemistries tend to be, there are contact herbicides. So they work best on small weeds with lots of water and very good coverage. And Bazagran really works best in a two pass system. So you would um, go and, and spray and then uh, spray once and then come back in about 10 days and spray again. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's, an, it's there, it's, it's a system that can be used. It doesn't get a lot of use, but it is there, I guess, kind of a, it, tends to be used maybe as a rescue treatment. It can get fairly pricey um, when you're looking at doing a two-pass system on this, but it's an option to think about if you need to get in there and get some of those weeds out. So again, Pardner, uh, Bromoxynol, which is group six. Again, it's a contact herbicide. Those group sixes are contacts. You've got to have lots of water. Um, you've got to have good coverage. It's just going to burn those weeds off, but it doesn't translocate within the weeds. So uh, you've got to do a good job of covering the weed with the spray. Uh, the staging is four to eight leaf stage, so you can't put it on too early and you don't put it on any later. Definitely no later than the eight leaf stage, but you or you can cause damage to corn. Really just this does broadleaf weeds and you can tank mix it with atrazine or atrex, but you don't use the oil in that case. Again, check your guide or check the product labels um, for all the um, all the specific instructions. But there's a you know a few options to, to use here. There's in something that's fairly new to Manitoba. Um, it's Shieldex. Um, it's a, a topyrolate. It's a group 27, so it's similar to our Armazon, same chemical grouping. Um, on corn post-emerge, up to 50 centimeters tall or six leaf collars. So if you're uh, looking at corn staging, you're counting the collar there, the visible collars on the leaves. And um, this does a really good job on water hemp. It's being used quite a bit in grain corn for water hemp. It does a great job on the pigweeds, the lamb's quarters, the green foxtail. You'll get suppression of a number of weeds um, with um, purslane, ragweed, shepherd's fur, smartweed, barnyard grass, and yellow foxtail. You have to use the high rate um, to, get that, to get that foxtail. Um, there's a couple of different rates uh, with this shield X. And uh, when you tank mix it with atrazine, that kind of rounds out your weed spectrum and, and gets you some more weeds. And so we are seeing a lot more use of this in our grain corn. We do have to be careful though, if we start overusing um, chemical groups, 
uh, we will get resistance very quickly to some of in some of these weeds. So we do want to be careful, but it is something new for us and a fairly new grouping that we haven't been using a lot of yet. Um, herbicide tolerant systems, and I know Tom had made a mention, you know, there definitely is herbicide tolerant sweet corns available for us to grow. Uh, if you want to grow them, um, you know, that's your choice. Can you sell the produce? Again, that's a completely different um, set of decisions you have to make. Um, basically, they make weed control a whole lot easier because you can spray glyphosate in crop or glufosinate, which is, we know it probably is Liberty, in crop. If you do decide to try some of this, these um, tolerant, herbicide tolerant systems, um, use Liberty, make sure you're using the right Liberty for this. You need to use the Liberty 200 SN um, or else crop damage will occur. And it's really uh, because of the level of um, surfactant that's in Liberty. Uh, you can't take the Liberty 150 and just adjust the rates up. You can get severe uh, crop damage on your corn if you do that. So if you are, if that is something you want to look at in the future, then just make sure you're using the right product. And as after that, we basically have mechanical weed control, and you're, you know you're going to have to take advantage of inter-row tillage until basically until the corn gets bigger and you're starting to damage it by driving over top of it and tilling between the rows. And other than that, um, after that, any weed escapes, you have to be careful what you're you you know you need to be you need to know what weeds are there. If you're seeing some weed escapes and you're seeing some big patches, make sure you know what's in there. We want to get in there with a hoe or we don't want to get in there and like, get, you know, some of these weeds, we really don't want them setting seed. Our pigweeds in particular, very prolific seed producers. And especially since we're having issues with herbicide resistance and, and weeds like water hemp coming into the into the uh, province, we don't, if we do have some of these weeds, we don't want to let them go to seed. So in that case, you would, after your inter-row cultivation is finished, you'd want to be going in and hand weeding if you could, or at least be aware of where some of these patches of weeds are and make sure you know what weeds they are. And um, if there's some of the really bad ones, you want to get rid of those before they set seed. because we, we just don't want that happening. So that was all I had. I know Tom, you had mentioned about um, herbicide residues um, to watching to plant corn into. Um, I guess some of the watch outs I'd be watching for, you have to be careful with treflan residues. So if you've had treflan on some of that land from before, some of your group two herbicides, your ALS um, inhibitors, uh, you have to be careful. Um, chemistries like flucarbazone, which is your Everest or Sierra, uh, pursuit residues, which is your any uh, subgroup of that group twos, you kind of really want to watch those. Um, you have to watch reflex residue as well. And um, that would be about all I could think of off the top of my head. But if you've got a specific question, we could certainly cover that and I can, I can get back to specific questions if you want. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. I'm just looking through the question and answer here. Um, there's one here. It's not particularly for you, Kim, but it is, is there varieties that we can plant that don't have worms in the cobs, like field corn? So certainly there is corn with the trait for uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, again, it comes back to the, the consumer acceptance of corn with that trait. Um, but yes, the answer is yes, there are varieties uh, out there that have the BT gene in it. Uh, I can't name you one right off the top of my head, but if you searched uh, BT uh, sweet corn and uh, called the local, local supplier, I'm sure they could. Uh, Tell you what's around. Um, and John just mentioned that the uh, the Stokes catalog has uh, four or so uh, BT varieties in it, so they are around. Anybody have any other uh, questions? I'm just looking through the chat. I seem to be stuck on this question. Am I running this chat wrong, Lori? No, no, you just have to scroll down. There is another one. Uh, have you ever experienced with pre-soaking seed before planting? Uh, personally, no. I have not uh, primed. 
I primed some other seeds, but not corn seed. I don't know how common that would be. Uh, John here, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's not water that sweet corn's lacking when you seed it, it's heat. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, no, cross that one off your list. There you go. Um, any others, Lori, that I'm missing? I just, I don't know why I can't navigate in here. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, there is one here. Is sap beetle an insect specific for corn? No, that's a short answer. John G might uh, want to expand uh, on that at all. Um, yeah, it, it's sap beetle. Like I said, they're attracted to anything that's somewhat um, decomposing. So uh, fruit growers, uh, raspberries, cherries, uh, basically any fruit that's somewhat going over ripe, they will feed on. You'll see them in compost uh, bins and things as well. So they're, they're definitely not uh, specific to corn. Uh, like I said, uh, fruit growers um, sometimes have a hard time with them as well, especially raspberries. I know in the raspberries, they can be a real nuisance at times. Right. Okay. That's, all I, see. that's all I see, Tom, for questions right now. That's okay. it. Uh, John back here, based on that pre-soaking of seed, uh, and, and I still believe it's heat that's missing, not water. Right. Uh, if you want, uh, next week we could dig up. There's been lots of some projects underway in northern Ontario where they plant and lay down plastic at the same time, and that gets them a couple weeks into the market early. Mm -hmm. So if you care about that, put this in the question, and we'll dig up some of those research results. and have them to show for you next week. Yeah, certainly uh, getting that extra warmth uh, with the heat under plastic is, uh, they've done work with that in other jurisdictions, not just there, but in other jurisdictions. Um, okay, so we're way over time and that's my bad, I spoke too long. So uh, I think we're gonna wrap up the uh, part one here. And next week we, for part two, we will uh, promise to move faster, partly because I won't be talking. Um, so, uh, if anyone has any questions... Well, can we tell them what's coming up next week? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll be talking about uh, field selection, uh, proper soils, uh, how to soil test, uh, fertilizer recommendations and fertilizer placement, and environment control. Yeah, and we'll do a, we'll do a little bit of a discussion too on uh, economics, but uh, there won't be a whole lot of detail there because the economics varies from farm to farm. There are some common threads that we'll be able to discuss, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be back uh, next week, and it will be shorter. Um, I. I'd like to I'd like to thank uh, presenters and attendees for taking the time today. Uh, come back for the conclusion uh, next week for part two. If any of you are CCA members, you want to receive CCA credits. In previous webinars, you've mailed them to uh, Tracy Cummer. You can send them straight to me. So if you send them to my email, t o m dot g o n s a l v es at gov.mb.ca we'll make sure you get uh cca credits if you're uh wanting and Tom, again my excuse me i just uh i just want to remind everyone that when they registered they probably put that in in during the registration so if you Good. did enter that when you registered we'll have record of that perfect thank you for reminding me Lori. um okay so uh, I promise we'll be shorter next week. Sorry for being long and uh, thanks again. I'm going to end it. Have a good day. Goodbye.